Fair and equal are not the same thing. There's a lot of talk now about inequities, and we should work to eliminate many inequities. The unequal treatment of people of different races is an obvious one. But there's one place where people get it wrong, even Harvard professors, and that is the wealth distribution. A country's wealth distribution should be highly skewed. Why? Because it would actually be unfair if it wasn't, and we will show why. What's worse is that professors have been deceiving people about what the ideal distribution could actually be. But a little math shows that their claim about the ideal is false. In fact, the country that a Harvard professor held up as the ideal has recently passed the U.S. in a measure of wealth inequality and has a distribution more highly skewed than the U.S. So why can't the distribution pushed by many be the ideal? Let's dive in and find out. In 2011, a Harvard and Duke professor published a simple study about America's view of wealth inequality. The professor surveyed over 5,500 Americans and asked them to pick the wealth distribution of a country they would like to live in if they were randomly assigned to a place in the distribution. In this survey, professors showed respondents three unlabeled distributions represented as these pie charts. One distribution was the U.S. distribution, which is highly skewed, a fictitious country with a completely equal distribution, and a slightly unequal distribution from Sweden. Americans overwhelmingly chose Sweden as the ideal. The results were spread far and wide on news outlets and social media. There was a very professional YouTube video created that focused on the results and discussed the extreme inequality in the U.S. and how far it was away from their ideal. So what's the big deal? Well, to start off with, the distribution they claimed to be the ideal does not exist in any developed country. It is not Sweden's actual wealth distribution. It seems the authors of the study didn't want to use the real Swedish wealth distribution, which recently is more inequitable than the U.S. wealth distribution, as measured by the Gini Index. The authors claim to use the Swedish income distribution instead, which is not as skewed as the wealth distribution. And that tends to be true for all countries. The wealth distributions are more skewed because some people have had a much longer time to accumulate wealth than others. Well, they claimed to use the Swedish income distribution, but they didn't cite sources so we can't verify what data they really used. I went to the official statistics of Sweden website and found the income data for 2011, which is the year the study came out, to see for myself, and the distribution is still more skewed from what they claim. But you don't even need to go searching for data to see that something is up here. The charts, for one, point to some sloppy work. The pie chart in the paper, which they said they showed to study participants, show the mathematically impossible result of a lower quintile having more money than a higher quintile. I thought it might have been a simple error, so I looked at the other graph in the article that's supposed to represent the same data, but it isn't much help. The largest quintile doesn't show the actual amount it's supposed to. The second and third quintiles are quite close to the same length, so they can't be accurate either. It's hard to understand how such errors could get published. The error-ridden charts and incorrect findings were spread widely by various outlets saying that the vast majority of Americans want an impossible wealth distribution that's represented in the charts. Few outlets questioned the research, but luckily a few quantitatively literate individuals have helped to point out that the distribution from Sweden was not their actual wealth distribution and was supposed to be an income distribution. But I haven't seen anyone explain why this distribution is all but impossible and is not nearly as fair as people claim. I should be clear here that I'm not doing this analysis to argue the claim that Americans want a more equal wealth distribution, or that a more equal distribution would be a good thing. I'm doing this analysis so that we can at least have conversations about a wealth distribution that is actually fair and possible. If the wealth distribution presented by these scholars is the starting point, we will all be disappointed. So why is this an impossible distribution? Well, we can first see that something's wrong by actually calculating how much wealth people would actually have under the presented ideal distribution. I'll do the calculations with the most recent wealth data I could find. So that's usually 2022, 2023, or even early 2024, so that we're discussing our more current reality and not to have to think in 2010 or 2011 dollars. The U.S. had a total household wealth of $161 trillion in early 2024. Using the percentages of each quintile of the supposed ideal distribution, and reordering them from the highest to the lowest, of course, we can calculate the average amount of wealth for each household. Here we have displayed the average wealth per household for each of the quintiles, and each quintile represents 20% of the population. This looks reasonable, but now let's consider that some of these households are at different stages of their life. Since we want things to be fair, we would want people that are younger to have less and people that are old to have more. 
since the younger households have more years to earn money and more time to let their wealth grow, while retirees would be at a stage where they're living off of their wealth. Using data on current U.S. households, I found that about everyone in the highest quintile would be 70 years older or over, or in a household where the head of house is 70 years old or over. The lowest quintile would be made up of individuals or head of households 34 or younger, with many being less than 25, even down to 20 or 19. So one question is, where are these 20 year olds and 25 year olds going to get all of this wealth? Here we start to see why this distribution is impossible. How are these young households supposed to get their hands on all of that wealth? They don't have time to earn it, and I don't think many citizens will be happy with taxes so heavy that we then turn around and give 20 year olds over a half a million dollars. So this distribution is impossible because the amount of wealth required for the young households is simply out of reach. But putting that aside for now, let's continue with our analysis. Let's start at the high end. The average net wealth of these households would be about $2.2 million. What kind of lifestyle would that allow them to live? Well, assuming they've paid off the average house, which is about $500,000 in the US right now, then they have $1.7 million left over. But not all of that will be investable assets, things like cars, furniture, etc. So maybe it'd be safer to assume the household has $1.6 million to invest. Using the 4% rule of retirement, which means you can pull out 4% of your investments and it will last indefinitely, then the household will be living off of $64,000. Definitely not bad since the home's paid off, as long as no one ends up in a nursing home, which costs almost twice that much annually. Remember, this is for a household, so if there are two people that end up in a nursing home, this is woefully inadequate. It isn't what many would dream about in their retirement, although much better than only having Social Security for your income. This means that for many families, they would need to use up their principal and risk running out of money before they die, so some might need financial help from their children. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. What about the young households? On average, the household in the lowest quintile would have about $670,000. That would make being young much easier. Plenty of money for a college education and more than enough for a down payment for a house. As mentioned earlier, I don't know where they are going to get all of that wealth, but putting that aside, the real issue is this. Using this wealth distribution, we just made the young households much richer than the old households. Let me explain. The amount that the young have now is less than what the old households have now, but how much will the current young have when they hit the 70 year old mark? Let's say that a young household, which could be an individual or couple or family, $600,000 of their wealth. How much will they have when they're 70? Let's make some reasonable assumptions and apply what we know about exponential growth to figure this out. We will be using this formula. So we need the initial amount, the time invested, and the rate of return. The S&P 500 has a 7.39% return over the last 50 years when adjusted for inflation. To be conservative, let's round down to 7% and assume the household saves nothing more for the rest of their life. Then a household with a 25 year old as a head of house would end up with more than $14 million when they hit 70. And that's adjusted for inflation. For the 30 year old head of house, they would have just under $10 million. Do you see now how this wealth distribution that seemed so fair is actually not fair? It keeps some people in a modest retirement while others get a lavish retirement or could retire much earlier and still have a nice retirement. That distribution is not nearly as equal as the percentages make it seem. As stated at the beginning, fair is different than equal. The percentages are much more equal, but at their best creates a society that is still quite unfair. And this is assuming the strict rule that younger people have less wealth than older people. Mixing people up in the distribution would just create more inequity. This ideal distribution might be reasonable if we restrict it to only households of the same age, however, but when taking a snapshot of the U.S. wealth distribution including households of all ages and sizes, what seems equitable is not really equitable, and what seems inequitable might not be as inequitable as it first seems. It isn't hard to find data on the net worth of U.S. households stratified by age, and here's one example. One thing to notice is that the proportion from the median to the average is about the same within each age strata, from 3.9 to 4.8, which is some evidence that the distribution might be quite similar for each of these age groups. We can actually try to estimate what the quintiles are from this data. Let's take the 45 to 54 range because it's a middle age strata. I will do this analysis using just five households. 
one representing the average person in each quintile. The median already gives us a good value for the middle quintile. Multiplying the average by 5 tells us the total amount of wealth that must be spread across the five households. I plugged in some other values and came up with this possibility. It still shows some large variation, with the highest quintile being about 56 times larger than the smallest quintile. Or it could be something even more equitable like this one, where the top quintile is about 29 times the bottom. But that's a far cry from the overall US distribution, which has the highest quintile 840 times larger than the average in the lowest quintile. So just as we thought, within an age strata there is much more equality than the entire distribution. And this shows that the US wealth distribution is not as unfair as it originally seems because we're comparing households at the same stage of life. Of course this still might be too much inequity, but it's not nearly as extreme as the overall distribution makes it seem. So what would the actual ideal wealth distribution look like? We will explore that in a later video. Our analysis in this video made some pretty broad assumptions. For example, we didn't consider if wealth should differ for households of different sizes. What do you think are some important factors to consider in a deeper analysis? Include them in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.